Welcome to Active Directory Sites and Services Overview. I'm Kevin Brown, and I'll be your trainer for this lesson. The topics we're going to cover in this lesson will be answering the question, what an Active Directory site actually is. I'm going to cover why you need to define sites, because they are critically important to your environment and they're not defined by default. So it's something that you do have to do within every environment you go to. And I'm going to show you how to actually do that. So we'll create some sites and set up some links between them and we'll see how all that actually works logically. And I'll show you exactly how it's configured within the interface itself. Be sure to check out the links in the description to some of my other courses. Many companies you go to work for will look similar to this. In my example, I have a domain name rts.local. My company is headquartered in Washington, but I also have an office in Dallas, another office in Phoenix, and one in Seattle. This poses a few challenges for me. One of the challenges, how does this actually function? How do all these things work in conjunction with each other? One concern from a user's point of view, which domain controller, I'm going to say DC, which domain controller do I actually use if I'm a user that's in Seattle? Now, what does not make sense? If I have a user in Seattle, we would agree that when this person logs on to a computer within the Seattle office, we would always want them to talk to a domain controller in Seattle. I don't want you to unnecessarily cross a WAN link and bypass the domain controller in your location and go to Washington or Phoenix to authenticate. So one of the benefits to creating sites is service localization. All that means you will always use local Active Directory services first in your physical location before you cross a WAN link to use those same services. That's one, service localization. The other concern, replication. I want to have managed replication within an environment that is geo-separated. In our picture, all of these servers are domain controllers in every location. What that means to me, Every domain controller in the same Active Directory domain will be a replica of each other. An example, if I were to go to this domain controller in Washington and I create a new user named Bob Ross, that user would replicate to the other domain controller in Washington, but it also replicates to the domain controller in Dallas, Phoenix, and Seattle. Well, what I want to do is be able to schedule that replication. Now, in Washington, they're on the same network. They're in the same physical location. I don't care when they replicate. Bandwidth is not going to be a concern within a physical location. The concern is always going to be the WAN link. At a network level, that is the potential bottleneck. So I want the ability to say, if I make a change in Washington, that change only replicates to Seattle every three hours. Now, maybe in Phoenix, we work a little more closely with Washington, so I want changes every one hour. Now, this replication is bi-directional, so a change in Phoenix would replicate to Washington within the hour, Washington to Phoenix would be within the hour, uh, Seattle to Washington and Washington to Seattle, both directions would be every three hours. In Dallas, I'm gonna say every 15 minutes which is actually the lowest replication setting uh, we can actually define, will be a 15 minute interval. We design this based on what our needs are between these different locations. Those are the two advantages to sites though. You always use local services first and you get the ability to actually schedule replication. Now, what's interesting is how this actually works. A site is always one or more IP networks. So when you look at my picture, notice in Washington, everything is on this 172.16 network. In Dallas, everything is on 172.17. 172.18 represents Phoenix. 172.19 represents Seattle. Now, because of that way routing actually works, every network is set up this way. 172.16 
You cannot have within your environment the same IP network and two different locations that are connected to each other because routing would never take place. Meaning, I could not have a computer with an address 172.16 in Washington and a computer on that same network in Seattle. Because if you tried to connect to the computer in Seattle, your traffic would never actually cross the WAN link because everything in Washington would say, oh, that's the local network that we're actually on. I don't need to route that across. I always compare this to phone numbers. If you live in Washington uh, area, your area code for your phone number is 202, the area code for the phone number. Well, let's say you live in Seattle. Your area code can be 986. Now, I'm totally making up that number 986. But your area code is tied to your geographic location. So I cannot have an area code of 202 in Washington and that same area code in Seattle. Because if you were to make a phone call and you dial one area code 202, whatever the phone number is, it would have no idea if that phone call needs to stay in the Washington area or does it need to be routed all the way over to the Seattle area if you were making a phone call? Well, that exact concept holds true for us here. We're just not talking about phone numbers. We're talking about IP addresses, but it's an identical concept. The way this logically works for us, if I have a computer in Phoenix, its IP address is 172.18.0.94. We know that's the network in Phoenix. It starts with 172.18. What happens when my user, Ted, I'll say, when Ted logs into this computer, it actually queries DNS saying, we need to find a domain controller. This user, Ted, is trying to authenticate. What domain controller should we pass Ted to so he can authenticate his username, his password? That query goes up to a DNS server. All DNS does is look through a long list of records that uh, point to every domain controller in your environment. I will show you that in just a moment when we get to the interface. But what DNS does, because it's so smart, it is aware of all the IP addresses of every domain controller, and DNS is also aware of every Active Directory site you actually have. So what it does, it'll tell Ted that this domain controller 172.18 is the first domain controller that he should reference. So you get a list of all these domain controllers. This one, since it's in the location that Ted is in on the same network, it always will get reference to this domain controller first. Now, it's going to get the other four domain controllers in the picture, but they would always be referenced after. So 100% of the time, you use the local domain controller on your site. If it is unavailable for some reason, then you would talk to Seattle, domain controllers in Washington, or domain controllers in Dallas. Now, if you work in Dallas, it is the same exact concept. My user here logs on. They're always going to be referred to the domain controller in Dallas first. So that will be first. Then below that, you'll get the domain controllers in Washington, Phoenix, Seattle. Now, at times, Washington, those domain controllers there, they may be second and third in the list. Sometimes they'll be you know, third and fourth. It does not matter. These will rotate periodically. But you will always get referred to the Dallas domain controller because that's in your location. That makes perfect sense. You always use local resources first. Now, let's take a look at how all this is actually set up in the interface itself. Be sure to check out my other courses I have hosted on the Udemy website. I have about 30,000 students. I have courses that range from Azure Administration to Azure Fundamentals, PowerShell courses, Security, Hyper-V. I also have courses that cover Server Administration, Group Policy, and Active Directory. These courses are some of the best sellers on the Udemy website, so be sure to check them out. The link is in the description below. I'm on my domain controller. Now on this machine, I did a clean install of the operating system and then I installed Active Directory, but I've not configured anything other than just the installation of Active Directory.
So I'm going to first pull up my Active Directory Sites and Services. And I'm also going to go back to my tools here and I'm going to click on DNS as well. I'm going to expand my Active Directory Sites and Services and I'm going to open the Sites folder. Notice right now I have one site. It is named Default First Site Name. If I expand that, there's this Servers folder under it. If I expand that, there is RTS-DC1. That is the name of my one and only domain controller that I have right now. Look, slide that over a bit. This is what you get in every domain you actually create. The first time Active Directory is ever installed in your environment, it creates a single site name, default first site name. So let's say you never create another site, but you build the picture we looked at earlier. You add a couple of domain controllers in Washington. You add a domain controller in Seattle, one in Dallas, one in Phoenix. Well, all those go to the same site, this default first site name. What that means, you cannot control replication between the domain controllers because if you leave them in the same site, what you actually told Active Directory is that these things are so well connected, I don't care when they replicate, so you won't be able to schedule it. That's one. The other concern is they will all be load balanced when you authenticate. So if I'm in Seattle, sometimes I would use the demand controller in Seattle. The next time I log in, it may send me to Dallas, it may send me to Phoenix, to Washington. Leaving those in the same site, you've also told Active Directory, I don't care which domain controller my user actually uses. So you would have no service localization. Now there is not a reason that you would choose to not create a site. So even if your WAN links are super fast, you still would want service localization. It's gonna be more responsive for your users. And even if you don't wanna schedule replication, you always have that option. So no matter what, we would wanna define these sites with an Active Directory. I mainly do it in my environments for service localization. Just why have a user authenticate across a WAN link when they have a domain controller in their physical location? It is just not efficient and defeats the purpose largely of having a domain controller local to them. Well, the first thing I need to do is create some sites. So I'm gonna right click this sites folder here and I'm gonna create a new site. I'm gonna name my first new site Washington so I'm just going to use WAS to abbreviate it. And I'm going to click this default IP site link. We'll see what that is in one moment. And I'm going to click OK. I'm going to create all the sites we had in that picture. So I'm also going to create a new site for Seattle. I'll choose that default site link and OK. I'm going to create another site for Phoenix. So I'll just name that PHX. Default IP site link, OK. And we'll create one for Dallas, was my last location. And I'll just click OK for that. So now I have the four sites that actually correspond to the graphic we used. The other thing we have to do is go to this new subnets. When I click on that, I have no subnets right now. So I'm going to right click new subnet. In the picture I had, the network 172.16.0.0 slash 16, which is the sitter notation. So we use that in lieu of the subnet mask, but that network was in Washington. So I'm gonna click Washington and I'm just gonna click okay. Active Directory now knows any IP address 172.16 is in Washington. Now I'm just gonna create one more of these, then it gets very repetitive. So I'm going to right click new subnet again, and this time I'm going to use 172.17.0.0 slash 16. That is in Dallas. So I'm going to choose Dallas and OK. Now you can see my subnet show up here. All I would do is right click new subnet again and specify Phoenix. I would do it again for Seattle. Now two interesting things here. Thing one. I could have just right clicked and renamed this default first site name. There's an option to rename. So I could have made that Washington if I didn't want to create my own, you know, Washington site and 
start moving things around. So you're totally fine to rename the default first site name that exists. That's actually what most environments actually do, but I just want to walk through the process of creating the new site. So I just created a new one. You can also have multiple IP subnets associated with the site. Now I did not have this in my graphic, but let's say we also have a subnet 192.168.1 and it's in Washington. I would just right click new subnet. And I'll say that's a 24 uh, sitter notation. So 192.168.1.0 slash 24, also in Washington. Now, if I go to the Washington site, I'm just going to right click that site and go to properties. You can see all the subnets associated with that site. So this is simply going to mirror whatever your actual IP topology is in your environment. Whatever network subnets you have in your environment, they're all going to be associated with those here. So Active Directory knows where everything is physically located. Now, I opened DNS before we started this for one reason. Right before we go to DNS, one thing I want to show you. I'm going to take my RTS-DC1 and this default first site name. I'm going to move it to the Washington site. Now, I can right-click and move. That'll give me a list of all my sites. And I could just choose Washington. But I'm going to click Cancel there. Because you could also simply take that RTS-DC1. You can also just click and drag it. Now, if I expand Washington servers, RTS-DC1 is in the list. Now, to see what really makes this work, I'm going to pull up DNS on my machine. I opened that a moment ago when we were going through our administrative tools. When I expand my RTS DC1, my forward lookup zone, I have this underscore msdcs.rts.local. Now, if you're not that familiar with DNS, where this comes from is when Active Directory was installed, it automatically created all these folders here. In DNS, we call them zones. It created this rts.local. That's the name of my domain. So any computers joined to my domain, all their DNS records of different types would all show up here. This msdcs is Microsoft Domain Controller Services. I'm going to put that in full screen. If I expand the underscore msdcs.rts.local, we can start seeing all the Active Directory records. There is a folder here named DC. Under that, there's a folder named Sites. If I click that, all the sites we just created show up. This is automatic. I did not create any of these zones here. When I installed Active Directory, DNS was installed. When I created the new sites, the new sites are automatically added here. Well, an example. I'm going to go back to Active Directory Sites and Services for a moment. And I'm going to right click on sites and I'm going to create one more new site. And I'm going to just name this SF for San Francisco. I'm going to go back to DNS. So there is no SF site there, but I'm going to click on my RTS dash DC one and click refresh. That'll refresh all the settings. Now, if I go back to that underscore MSDCS, DC, expand sites, you'll see SF shows up in the list. So it is a hot link between that Active Directory Sites and Services and the DNS. If you delete a site, it gets deleted from here automatically. Well, when we were there, I moved my domain controller from the default first site name to Washington. Well, if I open the Washington site now, there's a TCP uh, folder under it. You can see the service location or SRV records that point to that domain controller. So this Kerberos, which is the authentication protocol uh, for Active Directory, every time you authenticate, you have to query and figure out who hosts this Kerberos service. Well, you can see if I open that, it says this service is hosted by RTS-DC1. So all we would do in sites and services is organize our domain controllers into their respective sites. Pretty fascinating.
a footnote to this. If you were to add additional domain controllers, you would have the IP address defined on those domain controllers, so they would automatically add themselves to the appropriate site. So you really, I always say, you set this and forget it. It's very much a one-time configuration, or if you open a new branch office, or if you create new IP subnets or networks, then you'd have to reflect those changes here. So that is what makes the service localization. The way this integrates with DNS, nothing beyond that do we configure. The other neat thing we can do, I can manage when they replicate. Now do remember, every time I right clicked new site, I had to click on this default IP site link. If I expand this inner site transports folder, there is an IP subfolder under it. And you'll see that default IP site link shows up here. Well, I'm just going to double click that and it opens up for me. So you can see all my sites are now part of this link. And notice they replicate every 180 minutes. So every like three hours they replicate. Well, I don't want to use the default link that exists. So what I can do, you could rename this and remove some of these from it. But what I want to do instead I'm actually going to right click and delete that link altogether. And I'm going to create my own. It's a new site link. And I'm going to name it Washington to Seattle. I'm going to click those two sites, Washington, Seattle. I'm just going to add those to this list and click OK. Now, if I go to the properties of that link, if I want Washington to Seattle to replicate every hour, whatever interval you actually want, you set that in the number of minutes here. Now, let's say a certain time of the day, there's a lot of traffic going across this WAN link. So I don't want replication to happen at a certain time of day. I can go to this change schedule and you can just say at a certain time, click in there and drag replication will not be available not going to occur during those times those days of the week so we have some control over that but i'm gonna just cancel that there so sites themselves at a basic level they're pretty straightforward to actually set up you define the name of your site you define the ip subnets that gets reflected in DNS, and I can create these IP site links that actually cover when they actually should replicate with each other. Pretty fascinating. The last two things I want to touch on are, I won't, I won't call them advanced, but they're just not as common. One, if I right-click this IP folder again, there is an option for a new site link bridge. What a site link bridge actually does is let me have what we call mesh replication. Now to look at that, what I'm gonna do first, I'm gonna create a new site link again, and I'm gonna name this one Washington to Dallas. And I'm gonna choose Dallas, and I'm gonna choose Washington. And I'm gonna add both of those sites and click OK. Now that works fine, but let's say I also want Seattle to replicate to Dallas. Let's say you have 50 locations and you have a site link from Washington to all 50 locations, but then you also want a lot of these sites to replicate to each other. You would have just this inordinate amount of uh, site links created. So what's possible, Washington and Dallas replicate across the first link, Washington to Seattle replicate across the second link. Well, if I go back and right click new site link bridge, this bridge actually lets me add site links to it. So I'm going to say this, I'm just going to name it bridge. But now any sites on either of these links can replicate directly with each other. So Washington to Dallas, Washington to Seattle. With the bridge, it also means Dallas can directly replicate to Seattle. Now, the point of this is to reduce the number of replication links you actually have to have. So you take individual links you already created and you essentially combine them by creating these site link bridges.
So that can be pretty useful. So I'll just click OK for that. And you'll see now that bridge actually shows up. And if you ever double click it, it'll show you what links are in the bridge itself. Another neat thing, it's a newer setting. If I right click this IP folder and go to properties, there is an option that says ignore schedules. Many people do this because they want the service localization. There is never a time it would make sense for me to have a domain controller in my office, in my physical location, and I cross a WAN link and authenticate against another domain controller. I just It doesn't make sense. Maybe you're not concerned about bandwidth from a replication point of view. So I can choose to ignore schedules. This will not wait 180 minutes to replicate. It'll replicate on the Active Directory default replication schedule. So when something changes, it's just going to replicate. So we just want to know that's a possibility if you're only concerned with this service localization. The other thing I want to touch on is this cost. So I'm going to click on one of these site links here. Notice every site link here has a cost. Well, we need to go back to our graphic to look at how this cost actually works. The default 100 we have here, just make a mental note that that's the default. Now let's go look back at the graphic. When we look at this graphic, what I have is referred to as a hub and spoke, meaning every change replicates in and out of Washington. Seattle, Phoenix, and Dallas do not directly replicate to each other. So if you created a new user in Seattle, your new user would get updated in Washington, then it would be replicated out to Dallas. What we can do is create what amounts to a backup link using these costs. The problem I have right now, let's say every 180 minutes, changes from Seattle replicate to Washington and vice versa. Every one hour, so every 60 minutes, changes from Dallas replicate to Washington. Well, this means it's going to be up to three hours before my new user shows up in Washington, up to another hour before that user actually shows up in Dallas. Now, that's fine in most environments. Uh, if not, you adjust your replication interval to be whatever is appropriate for your environment. But what we have a concern about Something goes very wrong in Washington. A blizzard or a natural disaster, catastrophic loss of power. Now, Seattle can't replicate to Washington. Uh, neither can Phoenix or Dallas. Well, when you look at this picture, Seattle, Phoenix, and Dallas, they don't replicate to each other. So now, any change you make in Seattle, it never gets over to Phoenix, never gets over to Dallas. So what I want to do is create a backup link. The way that works for us, clean off my slide here, the default cost for every link is 100. So Seattle to Washington cost 100. Washington to Dallas cost 100. Washington to Phoenix cost 100. Now let's say when you replicate, I want you to replicate through Washington. That's the preferred route. Well, looking at this graphic, if I created, say, a new user in Active Directory, the cost for me to replicate this direction, 100 across the first link, plus 100 to replicate to Phoenix. So the total cost is 200 for me to go from here then to here. You simply add up all the cost of all the replication links you actually go through. Whatever those site links are defined as, that's your total cost. Well, if I want a backup link, I simply create a new site link between Seattle and Phoenix. I give that a cost of 300. That is what makes it a backup. If I replicate directly across this link, Seattle to Phoenix, well, cost across that link is going to be 300. The other way is only a cost of 200 if I go through Washington. 100% of the time, you attempt to replicate through Washington only because it has the lower cost. 
That is the absolute only metric this uses. It does not look at bandwidth or anything like that. It just says cost on this link is higher or lower than the other. We're always taking the lower cost. So with this, you always replicate to Washington. But if you can't communicate with Washington, you know, it's failed for some reason, then it would replicate across the higher cost WAN link. This cost is a non-issue, not something you're concerned about until you have a loop, basically, multiple ways to get to the same location. If you just have a true hub and spoke, that number just means nothing. Not until you have links that uh, can go multiple directions. That's when you start getting into the cost. A fun fact, if your cost is identical on both, it will alternate between the two. So if it's 200 across Seattle and Phoenix, sometimes it'll use that link with the cost of 200. Next time it may use the other link. So effectively it would use both if the cost is actually equal. But usually you don't set the cost to be equal. You would always have a preferred route uh, that you want this to actually take. Whatever's most efficient in your environment. Now, for me, it would make sense since Washington is like headquarters and central to this uh, layout we have here. Makes sense. I want everything updated there first, then replicate it out to other locations. So in summary, the point of all this was these two things. Service localization, so you always use local services first, and the ability to schedule when replication should occur. Be sure to check out my other courses I have hosted on the Udemy website. I have about 30,000 students. I have courses that range from Azure Administration to Azure Fundamentals, PowerShell courses, Security, Hyper-V. I also have courses that cover Server Administration, Group Policy, and Active Directory. These courses are some of the best sellers on the Udemy website, so be sure to check them out. The link is in the description below.